the main purpose of life, you could call it the heart of being human, is to be happy. All of us share the same wish and the same right to seek happiness and avoid suffering. Even following a spiritual path or a religious life is a quest for happiness. Even in the case of Buddhism, it is for the ultimate, the whole purpose of it is, is to, it, to achieve what is called the ultimate happiness of enlightenment. But some of us, or some of you may think, enlightenment well, meant well, that's not for me, it's only for holy men and women. I want something practical, especially Germans. But, but, but actually there's nothing more practical than what wanting to attain of the attain enlightenment because what enlightenment is, to put it simply, is to be completely free from suffering and find ultimate and lasting happiness because until we realize enlightenment, Whatever happiness we have is only temporary. So, where do we find this lasting happiness? In fact, it's in the realization of our ultimate nature. In fact, everything is here within us. The truth is within us, happiness is within us, true happiness and peace of mind cannot be found anything in anything external. It can only be found within, within oneself. But unfortunately, we are always seeking, looking to find ourselves outside of ourselves. As one great master called Patrambachi put it, he put it, it's like keeping the elephant at home but looking for its footprints in the forest. We keep the elephant at home but looking for its foot in the forest. We want happiness but the very way we pursue it is so clumsy and sometimes unskillful that it only can bring us more suffering. As a great Buddhist saint called Shantideva, in the 9th century, this great Buddhist, great Buddhist saint, he said, He said, though longing to be happy in their ignorance, they destroy their own well-being as if it were their worst enemy. Although they long to get rid of suffering, they rush headlong towards suffering itself. So... So 
clear? Why aren't we happy? The happiness is actually within us, but we always look for it outside of ourselves. Hoping for happiness and fearing suffering. We waste so much time always hoping, always fearing. Don't you notice that everything we do is based on hope and fear? That's why That's why great Tibetan masters and lamas always say, don't have too much redok. Redok means, re means hope, dok means fear. Fear, hope in the sense of expectation, over expectation, expecting, expecting, fear. In fact, both of these come from the ego, actually. This, this is known in the Buddhist teachings as what is known as the eight samsaric dharmas or eight worldly concerns where all one's actions are governed by hope and fear. That is to say, hope for happiness, fear of suffering. Hope for fame, fear of insignificance. Hope for praise, fear of blame. Hope for gain, fear of loss. In essence, all of these expectations, the hope and fear, which are really none other than attachment and aversion. If we are so attached to our own happiness and have so much aversion to any possibility that we may suffer, that what really is the source of creating hope and fear. I put it very simply, it is what makes us always really suffer, the turmoil, is actually hope and fear. I remember in my own kind of, how do you say, life, uh, when I was following my masters, even on the spiritual path, so much hope and fear comes. You see, hope for the master to recognize you <laughs> and love you and care for you. Fear of that he might ignore you. Like hopeful, like understanding, fear of ignorance. You understand? And actually it's so tiring. Because when you have hope and fear, you never, how do you say, get satisfied. Always these two just troubling hope and fear. And that makes you very kind of jumpy. Jumpy. You're like very, how do you say, uncertain. It always, you see, always like, you know, you understand? Is that clear? It was such a relief that when you're slowly letting go of hope and fear, when you let go for a few, because you see, the thing is, even if you hope, you, you, might, you might not get it. <laughs> You can hope for it, but you might not get it. So, the expecting and hoping, in a sense, in an unrealistic way, is in fact, uh, how do you say, only aggravates you. And sometimes even fear is very exaggerated. Fear is often when we don't really face things, when we don't accept you understand? When just simply not wanting to suffer, wanting this thing. In fact, fear also comes from hope. Hope 
In fact, if there was not hope, there would not be fear. If there was no fear, there would not be hope. On the outside, sometimes we may be quite simple, you know, look quite happy and successful, but inside we are actually quite complicatedly unhappy. Even though our actual circumstances might not be so bad, we might even be quite well off. But inside we always feel like a poverty stricken and deprived of something. And we always want more and more than what we have. So our desire becomes insatiable. And we think, oh, if only I had more money or more this job or this house or someone to love me or more teaching or whatever, then I'll be happy. But we never feel, you know, but never feel that we can actually have enough, you see, we become insatiable. And that, sorry. and that is also the cause of worry. You understand? In fact, this great Buddhist saint called Nagarjuna, I think he's sometimes Dalai Lama always consider him that after Buddha, perhaps he was the greatest teacher. He said, this is very famous, there's no treasure like contentment. There's no ornament like virtue. There's no misery like worry. There's no protection like patience. There is no treasure like contentment. I said that before already. And there's no friend equal to generosity. Do you want me to say that once again? There's no virtue, there's no ornament like virtue. That means, you know, when you have virtue, that is the greatest ornament. Better than diamonds. <laughs> there is no misery like worry. There is no protection like patience. It's like sometimes known as the armor of patience. Like in the case of a Bodhisattva warrior, his treasure is contentment and his uh, protection or his armor is the endurance or patience. There's no treasure like contentment, there's no friend equal to generosity. So, so often you see, when we're in this state, you see, of hope and fear, we feel unwell, physically, mentally wrapped up in our own suffering. We have no happiness, no joy, because we're never satisfied. We try to build a happiness on endless conditions that can never be fulfilled. Our minds are always filled with too many expectations and we do not appreciate what we have, our lives.
Not only are we continually hoping for more, desperately wanting more, but we are also terrified at the possibility of losing what we already have. It is a kind of a double-edged sword. Seemingly free, we are trapped in a self-created cage of hope and fear. We are frightened that if anything changes, we will lose everything. And also we associate so strongly with our image of ourselves, how we should be, with what our life should be like in order to be happy, that it is hard for us to accept the possibility that anything might go wrong. So we try to plan, organize, arrange our lives in order to keep everything as secure as possible. We hold on to everything so tightly, falsely believing that we might, that we must grasp onto what we have in order to ensure our happiness. For example, in the relationships, you see, love is always spoiled by attachment. Our insecurity, our possessiveness and our pride, all that kind of, you see, so much so that, you know, this, you may have a wonderful love, but you just spoil it. See? What you already have. What you already have, you cannot appreciate or accept, but that you're just fearing. You understand? Although we have been made to believe that if we let go, we will end up with nothing, but the life itself actually reveals again and again the opposite, that letting go is the path to real freedom and happiness. That, that life is impermanent. The discontinuity is part of the fundamental continuity. As I say always that if a watch doesn't tick or move or change, it's not working, it's dead. If the hearts are not beating, constantly changing, then we're dead. It is actually the changes that keep life alive. Provide us with the opportunity to change. Most of all, what change and impermanence teach us is to let go of grasping and an attachment which only bring pain and suffering. The reason we become so fiercely attached to things, from our emotions, to ideas, to opinions, to our, and to our possessions and other people, is because we have not taken impermanence to heart. Once we can accept that impermanence is the very nature of life and that everyone suffers, including ourselves, 
at the hands of change and death, then letting go becomes the only natural thing to do. In fact, the only thing that works. Then our attachment is loosened and impermanence becomes a consolation, bringing us peace, confidence and fearlessness. The most important of all, we can see clearly how futile is to grasp at something which is simply ungraspable because it's always changing. Though we know that everything is by nature impermanent, somehow we can't accept it. Instead, we try to cheat the natural process, which is impossible because that goes against the very laws of nature. So as a result, we get hurt. Because you see, when you really look into life, you see, everything is in the state of change, you understand? Know? And that manifests in the form of what we call interdependence, because everything is interdependent. Or put it, maybe more put it more simply like this. When you look, you see, the fundamental, fundamental Buddhist view of philosophy is, Now, for example, you see, when you don't believe, you call it, uh, when you don't follow the path, you call it philosophy. When you follow, it's called the view. What is the fundamental philosophy or view? Is that everything is interdependent. Everything is interdependent. Particularly in this modern day and age, that is shown even more so. In fact, that interdependence is very much connected with impermanence. It is because it's impermanent, that's why it's interdependent, or it is because it's interdependent, it's impermanent. Is that clear? But also because, you see, but what is also amazing is that because everything is interdependent, that means everything is impermanent. Everything is in a state of flux and change. Therefore, we are very powerful. We can change the change. We can influence the change. Therefore, our actions of the body, speech and mind are powerful, particularly our motivation. Our heart is really the determining. In fact, in the teaching it is said, everything in this, all phenomena are circumstantial. In Tibetan it's very beautiful. Chuna tamchi all phenomena are circumstantial. It all depends upon the intention. You understand? The intention and the motivation is determined. The so therefore, that when you talk about the uh, action, which means also the karma, cause and effect. That's why interdependence, impermanence, 
and karma are all connected together. You see? They're the, they're, the, they're the kind of, how do you say, they are the, put it this way, they all say the same thing. All that we have to do is to accept impermanence once for all, if we can. In fact, I was going to say a little bit later, the main point, but I'll say a little bit now also. Which is, you see, who are we? Who are we? Who am I? Are we all the thoughts and emotions that we have, all the stories? I mean, we can go and talk about this at great length, but I'll cut it short. Which is that everything, all these things like the uh, thoughts and emotions, all these things which actually we source it as being ourself, is actually always changing. Now, this I'm sharing something really important, the heart. In fact, just recently, I've been discussing with some of my Lama friends. We're talking quite deeply about how can we show, you know, how can we understand very simply, how can we show, how can we understand. It was a kind of very inspiring kind of, how do you say, gathering, just few of us. And during the discussion, it came very clear that really, actually, all this you see, everything is all this you see, like thoughts are changing, emotions are changing, everything is changing. So if you, if you kind of grasp onto it, identify that as you, then it is not very reliable. Is that clear? Do you understand? But then, what then is really us that is constant and unchanging? Is this. In a fundamental mind stream, there is this clarity, the cognizance. In fact, the, if you were to ask what is the quality of mind, or the quality of mind is to know. No. You understand? Look at this. We, there's a kind of clarity. We know the cognizance. I don't want to be bogged down with words because some can call it mind, others can call it consciousness, many things. When you start getting down to words, then it limits us. Let's look at more experientially. You see, in our basic, you see, like for example, in Tibetan it is said, in, or in the teachings it is said, what is the definition of a human being? Is, uh, is someone who can understand and someone who can communicate. Do you understand? That understanding or the, who is the understander? What is that understands? This knowing quality of mind. The knowing quality. The knowing quality. This cognizance. We can call it also clear light. This cognizance has been there uh, with us when we were very young, 
when we were teenagers, <laughs> when we are now, and even when in our old age. In fact, in the Buddhist teaching, said this consciousness will continue until enlightenment. This, this pure kind of consciousness, or you understand? Now, trouble is, we do not recognize that. We don't. We, we don't come to know that. Instead, what happens is we just grasp onto thoughts, emotions, which is just merely the manifestation of the mind. Really. In fact, it is also because of this that we have hope, fear, all that. That actually through the, through the teaching, through the wisdom teachings, through the practice, when we come to really, how do you say, free the mind of grasping. Because at the moment this, this knowing mind has been misused by the ego to grasp. You understand? And then the whole point of the spiritual path is free the mind of its grasping and to return to the pure knowing. Is that clear? And it is this, it is this is the goal of meditation at the highest level. The meditation at the beginning may be method oriented. Such as practice of mindfulness. You see, of breath or any other object. But the ultimate the point of it all is slowly free the mind of its grasping. It's a bit like slowly allow the clouds to slowly dissolve, revealing the more the sky-like nature of our pure mind. And it is when you come in to discover this and experience this, something amazing, when you experience that pure mind, free of all the stories, of hope and fear, all this, or put it another way, when you experience that, actually you're free of hope and fears. All the stories. You understand? And where is that? Where is that clear awareness? Nowhere. With you. Always. Always. Unchanging. Always. Our emotions, the thoughts may be happy. Sad, but that really the our fundamental mind of that is always constant. It is actually coming to know this. Like, for example, when you come to discover that, and from out of that comes the great simplicity. Simplicity. You understand? Contentment. Joy. Happiness. Even though your world or your life may be complex outside, but because you've discovered the inner, the freedom, 
of mind of this natural simplicity we could also call it finding the natural great peace once we discover that that even though we may things may be complex outside but yet that inside it's all simple uncomplicated in fact sometimes we can call that a carefree dignity when we discover that then we have a carefree dignity or put it this way then there is a tremendous how do you say when we discover this then there's kind of a how do you say freedom humor joy is that clear it's like this here now see now now for example me myself i'm actually quite happy quite content i'm not bothered with my thoughts in fact at this moment there are no thoughts also yes but if there's no thought then probably i will not be able to speak isn't it so there has to be some kind of a thought but it doesn't bother me it just comes it's very useful thoughts are very useful emotions are very useful and also one thing very important this when i talk about this awareness by the way it's not connected with mind only ah huh, by the way it's very much with heart it is to do with feeling is the fundamental pure feeling pure feeling pure heart is that clear pure heart pure feeling and that comes when we touch with ourselves because you see when it's cloudy we're not really in touch with the sky really it's cloudy <laughs> it's obscured it is when it becomes clear or you take a plane and go beyond the clouds then you can experience what sky is really is it clear actually this is the main thing and then to enjoy that enjoy yourself enjoy yourself it's a great feast it's a great feast and really then also it's incredible you become your own master meaning you know as you over as you come into touch with yourself you've conquered your mind as you conquer your mind you conquer your perception and the appearance also no longer can bother you because it really depends upon the mind how we perceive like his own dalai lama when he's always asked by the people sometimes by the press when they ask him what is the art of happiness how to be happy he always says i've heard him say many times he said granted that external circumstances and situations do contribute to a certain extent to one's happiness or suffering but ultimately really it depends upon the mind how our mind perceives 
You understand? To the all the five senses, you know? Senses. When we, you know, when we, how do you say, when we interact. You understand? Yeah? And when we then, how we perceive. You know? The, how the, in fact, how the perceiver is. How the perceiver is, the perception is. How we perceive. When you are in a negative state of mind, you can perceive everything negatively. For example, when you're paranoid, even you find your friends, you see them, you become very suspicious of them. Uh, even a helpful word could be interpreted as some kind of a criticism. Whereas when we are really in touch with ourselves, when we mind, when we are, how do you say, when we are in touch with ourselves, then you see when we are really comfortable in ourselves. This is also being comfortable in yourself. Because normally we are not so comfortable. What makes you uncomfortable? Hope and fear. <laughs> You understand? How I will look, how I will be, how others will think. Yeah. Well, you know, others will think whatever they think anyway. <laughs> you cannot control. <laughs> They'll think whatever they think. You try your best, but you won't be able to, you know, because if you try to always try to please or form yourself, you know, according to people's perception or, you know. I think it was uh, Abraham Lincoln who said, I think. You can please all people sometimes. <laughs> you can please some people all the time. But you cannot please all the people all the time. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't care, you know. You know, because as long as we are in this world, we have to act in accordance with the others. Even the Dalai Lama, he was saying, his teachers told him that even your Dalai Lama, when he was brought up young, he said, he said, means your conduct must be in court with the others. That means, you know, always. We must also act appropriately. You understand? That is important. But then we go extreme. <laughs> it's like we're not really in touch with ourselves. We not really know who we are. But on the other hand, we try to be, you know, what everybody wants us to be. <laughs> we want to please this, please that. And then it becomes like, how do you say, such an exhausting thing. In fact, something amazing is, on the other hand, when you really come into touch with yourself, when you really become you, become you, and really comfortable in your own skin, well in yourself, then actually you're well with others also. Like one of the main problem is, is about transparency these days. Hmm? Transparency, how to be transparent, how to be true. You know, whether you be one in your job, in your business, another in your family, and another with yourself. It's exhausting if you have to change all the time. It may turn out the wrong one will come. Maybe in the family, the business will come.
But there's a simple, there's a simple solution that when you're really genuine, when you're real, authentic, then that is that exactly what you need in your job. <laughs> that is, if you are a leader, you will win respect. If you walk what you talk, in your family also, if you are that, And if you're with yourself also, then you're transparent. I think all of us, you see, I think the life in this modern age has become very complex. In this complex world, the real way to survive is to be genuine. <laughs> you know, there's a saying called, honesty is the best policy. That means when you're genuine, when you're real, then you know you're real. People can feel. Particularly the people in the West are very intelligent. They might be confused, little neurotic sometimes, but very intelligent. In fact, it is because they're very intelligent, that's why they're little neurotic. <laughs> They also go in hand in hand. Very, you know, they can feel, you know, they can suss out, they can see something genuine, you know, something original. Do you understand? So, that, in fact, when you find that and be that, it's so simple. Easy. So that if you're there, then it's 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 fine in every situation. That's what Dalai Lama, I remember, in once in a conference of the Tibetan lamas, all the lamas, Buddhist teachers, we were talking about about you know there were a number of people who were bringing the issue about how to teach the West. All the Western people have their own kind of, how do you say, they have different psyche. You have to teach in a Western people in a, in a special way. And someone was presenting quite a complex, you know, like the method of how to communicate to Western people. <laughs> Dalai Lama interrupted, said, <laughs> Is it, I don't know. I don't know. Myself. Myself. I'm always myself. And I just, you know, good at communicate. It basically seems it works. And then you are happy. There's no duplicity. No duplicity. Then you don't have to worry about someone finding out. Because you are what you see. And it's pretty good. Is that clear? I think really We have to find that in ourselves. That's why sometimes when we practice, or receive teachings, when they receive teachings, it creates an environment in which they can become free of their stories. And find themselves. And then, in that, there's, there's really feeling of freedom. But like, 
then you become really alive, you know. You feel really good. There's a feeling of really goodness that warms your heart. You understand? And also in the practice also. When you practice, the whole point of practice is to dissolve. Yeah? Dissolve the un... how do you say? The unreal selves. The, all the... how do you say? The untruths. This a new English word I'm making it. All the untruths. All the forces. Sometimes you see, sometimes we're not trying to be false, but in the confusion, we kind of appear to be false, even though we're genuine. Do you know what I'm saying? You know? That's because of hope and fear. Because you see, sometimes when you hope and fear, and you really try to manipulate, try to, you know, and try to really do that, it always, you see, end up <laughs> on your face. Like I with my masters. I try to have little tricks with them first. To, 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 you know, to, to, you know, how do you say? And whatever, just lands right on your face. <laughs> So you realize that trying that way is, is not the way. It is when we let go of the hope and the fear and be genuine. In that genuineness, there is real devotion, real appreciation, real love, real compassion, real faith. And then when you realize this, when you mourn more, because you see, trouble with us is, you know, we have sometimes little glimpses of that. Glimpses of that. And sometimes those glimpses are so amazing. Sometimes we think it's an extraordinary experience. It is an extraordinary experience. But actually, it's not very extraordinary, because it's really you. It's quite ordinary. For example, in the Mahamudra, and the Dzogchen teaching sometimes, the f fundamental deed, like the true nature mind, sometimes described as Tamal Shepa. Which is a Tibetan word, if you didn't understand. Tama means ordinary. Shepa means awareness or mind. So, ordinary mind. What is the ultimate issue? It's ordinary mind. A teacher like Chukyam Chungar translates as the wisdom of ordinariness. But many translate as ordinary mind. Because really, because why, why we call it ordinary? Because it's the natural mind. Your natural self. You see, in fact, it's also, you see, when we discover that natural self, actually, we, actually there is no ego. Because I think sometimes we must not mistake. Ego you know, ego, when you talk about ego, it also connects with the sense of self. That's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't mean once you follow Buddhist teachings, you should have like egoless. That means you should not have any sense of self. That's really a misunderstanding. In fact, real, like, how do you say, practitioners, 
they have a really sense of self and authentic self. Like for example Dalai Lama for you. And so much so that it radiates. But then what is ego? Normally when we see ego in a negative sense. Is when we don't have that and when we try to be something when we try to be this, try to be that. You understand? This, that, all that. Then grasping. Yeah. Then that's where the confusion, the struggle, the hope and fear. In that, then all the negative emotions, all that come. In fact, that's what obscures us. It is when we really experience a fundamental nature, this simple self, this pure self, is you can call psychologically, you experience a very healthy ego. Someone like that has a very healthy ego. Because someone like that is not dwelling in neuroses. In fact, it's an incredible therapy. <laughs> I, I call it the, the, the Rikpa therapy. Rikpa is the ultimate nature mind. Like when you discover that, when, like for example, when the sun shines, all the darkness dissolves. Like that, when you discover the ultimate nature mind, all the delusions, the neuroses, all dissolve. You see? Now, with us, many of us, we have little glimpses of it, that. But we do not live that. We do not abide by that. Instead, we are confused. That's what's called samsara. Samsara, as one great master called it, is mind turned outwardly lost in its projection. So we turn out of ourselves and lost in all the stories of you and you go further and further from you making many stories but completely losing connection with yourself. You understand? That's why Nirvana is, the Master say bringing the mind home, gathering the mind, bringing the mind home, where it really belongs, and to recognize the true nature of mind. Because at the moment, we live very much in the other selves, in the outer selves, in the samsaric selves, in the neurotic selves. You understand? And we don't really, and in, when we do that, we lose touch with ourselves, really. So then we get depressed in the stories. When we, for example, really discover the Sa, true nature, this natural mind, the simple mind, this pure self, and if you live that, Hmm? while eating, while sleeping, while walking. There's this very great saying by a Zen master, you know? When a student asked him, how do you practice enlightenment in your everyday life? He says, I eat when I eat, I sleep when I sleep. So then student, but, but everybody eats, everybody sleeps. Then the master says, but everybody doesn't eat when they eat. Everybody doesn't sleep when they sleep. From there, the famous saying comes, 
I eat when I eat, I sleep when I sleep. That means, that means you see pure, pure action. You see, you live, you live in the moment. But when you say live in the moment, you're just simply only in the moment, you know. That means when you live in the moment continuously, and then you're living all the time. You understand? Whereas we don't live. We live in the past. <laughs> we live in the future. While thinking of the past, we miss the present. While thinking of the future, we miss the present. That's in fact, more and more we live this way. And more and more we come to know this self. This our pure mind, our pure nature, or you can call it the nature of mind a little bit, when you come to know. The, then, in a sense, there's, how do you say, becomes more stability, stability, more certainty, because also in this world, we always live in an uncertainty. Hope and fear, you know. To be or not to be. As Tignahan says, to be or not to be is not Buddhism. So you just live every moment. Live moment. In touch with. And when we are in touch with that, is the best way of taking care of the past best way of also preparing for the future best way to purify the past best way to purify to, to be prepared for the future is that clear and when you live this way more and more then you become happier and happier you might even be joyful There's a danger. And then what happens? You don't become so uptight. You're not less stiff. You know, the stiffness, the uptightness, all this comes from not knowing. And if somebody asks you a question, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're kind of, you know, you're afraid to reveal yourself or, uh, it's all kind of, you know, when we're with some, when we're with people, we cannot be ourselves. Then you say to afterwards, ah, why was not am I really myself? <laughs> you feel bad about yourself? I'm not really myself. You don't feel good because it's not really yourself. You're not, you're not satisfied because you were not satisfied with communication. The communication is actually not words. Communication is way of being. Just as, for example, with the dying. Or with those mentally ill, or those suffering. One of the best ways to help is actually by yourself, being yourself. It's not what you say or what you do, it's actually how you are. If someone who's very, how do you say, let's, if you have a, if you, if you're like, if you're a doctor or if you're a therapist, or if you're a nurse or somebody working with somebody who's been very mentally disturbed, you know? The best way to be genuine. Yourself, genuine. You know? If you're there, 
then they begin to feel like they trust you. So therefore, first, you have to actually discover yourself and trust that and live that. And then it's amazing also, you realize, when you continue to do so this way, then you realize, kind of, you know, you realize really, in fact, thought and emotions are not really you. No, so they are you, but not really you. There are stories of you. There are reflections of you. There are shadows of you. But they're not really you. In fact, when you realize this, you begin to discover a little bit of space between thoughts and emotions. There's a little bit of space. Thoughts, emotions can rise, but they're not intense, or they they're not so, you know, you, you know. How do you say that you don't become so desperate? There's more space, and there's more humor. Humor, and there's more understanding. Because emotions also want your understanding. Your thoughts also want understanding. Your emotions really like you to understand them. <laughs> In fact, they're begging for it. Please understand me. Your thoughts are also begging you to understand. But trouble is, the understanding is not the story. This is merely a perpetuation. Perpetuating. Perpetuating. More soap, like a... You know television, the soap operas? More stories. Do you understand? In fact, I stopped here. <laughs> because we don't have to go any further. We don't have to go any further than yourself. An elephant is really at home. Please don't go for searching for its footprints in the forest. So then, you see, we realize, because normally what we do is we always identify, identify with the thoughts, emotions, rising as me, but then when you when you realize, you see, the, the, you know, then you realize that thoughts and emotions rise, but you recognize that they're not, they're not really you. You realize they rise on the base of some kind of a condition and circumstances. But they're all impermanent, like bubbles, like rainbows. They come and they go. So, so you create some kind of a space and distance between you and the thought emotions. And then you return to the natural mind. And abide by it. And there you discover the simple self, simple insight, even though it may be complex outside. When you're able to be this way, 
you have an extraordinary dignity, dignity of carefree. See? And from this discovery, the simple self, from out of this a feeling of goodness, you see, really you feel goodness. Really? I think it, remember I was saying, it also connects with feeling. Very much with feeling. Feeling. When you come in touch with that, it's feeling. I'm, I'm not talking about this like the, this like the mind, quality mind is to know, you know, like the, the clear awareness. I'm not talking about just on an intellectual level. Huh? When you really see, discover, feel, then there's a tremendous sense of goodness, feeling of goodness that warms the self. And your heart warms, the appreciation, love, compassion, devotion, and faith all spring from this. So, then you begin to recognize, you see, this continuity of the openness and knowing. With basic goodness is who we really are. You understand? That's why, like you see, when you, when we really are great practitioners, when they meditate, they're not meditating on something. They're just abiding by recognition of their true nature. The continuity of this openness, this awareness, this, you can call it this clear light also, with basic goodness. And that is very, very juicy. It's what flavor, this, it's with this flavor, love, joy, compassion, devotion, faith, contentment, patience, no worry. There's a very famous Australian phrase. It's the ultimate introduction nature mind to an Australian. No worry, mates. Australian, when you say mate, mate is a very way of like a, mate is really like a friend, but it's more than a friend, you know. Mate. Like, really, you know, I mean, really. I remember someone sending me this card of a koala bear, you know, Australian. Yeah. On a, on a surfboard. And there's a huge surf coming behind him. Huge surf. In the hands up behind him. Completely relaxed on this big surfboard. The caption b below is, No worry, mates. In fact, actually, when we discover this, then even if everything falls apart, there is something in you that never gives you up, never lets you down. In fact, when you discover that on a really deepest level is not only called the Buddha nature, it's called the inner teacher. Mm -hmm. 
the real teacher is that because what does really master teach you teach you the recognition give you what does really the master do really introduce you to the nature of your mind when you discover that when that's with you always then your master is never separate from that's the wisdom lama so that continuity of openness the knowingness this basic goodness is what we are and in the vajrayana language and when we discover that is also you discover what's called mahasukha of great bliss you see because when you discover that then you discover the great bliss in fact that is the source of everything source of everything root of everything You know that? And when you have that in your gut level, then you feel sure, hmm? certain, clear, confident, and you have trust. And you have faith, you have devotion, you have compassion. Just compassion, love just exudes. And that's why whilst on the path is very important when you even having discovered that it's always good to say to yourself what I am is this clear cognition all thoughts and emotions or all thoughts and emotions arising are not really me trust that what you are is the clear knowing awareness in fact milarepa he said i am a king there's no king like me i have such wealth see milarepa as you know was tibet's great saint yogi and poet who inspired millions of people but he spent years in retreat in the humblest condition wearing just a loin cloth and eating nettles so much so that his body has become emaciated and become almost green <laughs> is the Yet he says I'm a king there's no king like me I have such wealth I have the seven attributes that lead to enlightenment I have the eight noble path this is my wealth my treasure house is filled with these riches riches I have the sky above as my castle I have the ground below as my estate. I'm the happiest king in the world. So once you have this kind of realization, this kind of view, this is what the thing of cancer but she says this good. Says once you have this view, all the delusory perceptions of samsara may rise in your mind. you'll be like the sky for example like sky you see when the rainbow appears in front of it 
it not particularly flattered. <laughs> and when the clouds appear, when the dark clouds appear, it's not particularly disappointed either. There's a set deep sense of contentment. You chuckle from inside as you see the facade of samsara and nirvana. This view will keep you constantly amused with little smile bubbling away all the time. Clear. Enjoy yourself. This self. Then you'll be happy. Do you understand? And I wish you that. I wish you, my deepest wish is that you discover that for yourself. This great treasure. And that you will keep bubbling. 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 And it become contagious also. In fact, according to the Buddhist kind of, how do you say, um, how would you say, story you can say, or belief, these stories are sometimes quite, how would you say, quite symbolic. Some take it literally also. It is said that you see at the end of the time, in this particular, like in the Kali Yuga, the Drake of Time, because of all the negative emotions have become gross and gross, it really completely, how do you say, pollutes the life of people. All kinds of diseases and all kinds of things. And then threaten us and life becomes shorter. And then we live only 10 years maximum. And we are only about this few inches tall. Said to be. Become smaller and smaller and smaller. Then few, I don't know, generations after or so, the Buddha Maitre appears. Someone this tall, walking about, and everybody's amazed. Oh, why are you so tall? Why you look so good? <laughs> and he says, I practice loving kindness. Then everybody starts practicing. They become a little taller. <laughs> then he appears a little bit bigger. <laughs> you know that what I'm trying to say is that I think sometimes in this difficult age, this is way for us to actually, how do you say, grow and to overcome the decadent age by living truly. When you do this, you're true to yourself, you're true to the Buddha, true to Christ, true to God. Very much so. Really, we must really, we all should try to live that. If only we can live this way, it makes such a difference. But then each of us have to realize ourselves, experience ourselves, discover for ourselves that tonight my hope is that just by kind of, how do you say, sowing a little bit of seed, or rather maybe some of you may, it beginning to, how do you say, turn your mind slightly, and realize this, and then if you begin to live hmm, by your pure mind, then gradually you will overcome all your thoughts, emotions, and all the difficulties, and you'll become happier and happier. 
clear. In fact, my heartfelt prayers is may you realize this and be happy. Really. And free of suffering. It's possible. In fact, this is what His Holiness in one statement he quoted this and I found it very wonderful. A great Tibetan teacher of the mind training once remarked that one of the mind's most marvelous quality is that it can be transformed. Thank you.